Welcome to episode number one at Saj Meets, where I confront property and business owners and the movers and shakers in our industry to find the truth behind their journey. Today we're heading off towards Essex in the first of our new series of meeting entrepreneurs. But what I really want to find out is, are they the real deal? And today we're going to meet James Sinclair to find out if he is the real deal. Hi, Saj. Such a pleasure to meet you. Thank you. We have actually met once before. Have we? I was trying to work out on the way here. Really were? And uh, it was at Drayton Manor. Right. It took me some thinking trying to work that out. I was at a business presentation you were presenting there. Was it, was it good? Yeah, you were good, actually. <laughs> but you did mention property there, and that's what got me curious at the beginning. Yeah. I'm thinking, this guy's uh, a marketeer, a salesperson. What's he doing talking about property, mentioning property? I love property. So... What hat would you say you primarily wear? Um, what, if you was to label me, yeah. Um, well, I suppose um, I've got a lot of property. I've got, um, uh, you know, our portfolio is well in excess of millions of pounds. Um, but I would always say I'm a business person first, property second, okay. because my thoughts are to build a profitable, safe stable property portfolio you need to build a commercially profitable enterprise business and you funnel the profits from the business into the property so if you're doing that then property is more of a passive thing it's an investment not really a business because i see property as a business yes i mean the, the reason i own property is so that the capital growth allows me to leverage the property to actually grow my business and then try and grow the portfolio at the same time so let me give you a case and example. Say I wanted to, yeah, we're sitting right now um, in one of our farm adventure parks. If I wanted to go and buy another farm adventure park and I got two, three, four, five million quids worth of equity, I could give that to the bank to leverage a loan to go and buy another zoo, another farm attraction, which would make way more profit and excess than just property rental profits. Although I have both and I do like both. Um, so my... My initial thoughts for when I was I bought my first property when I was 18 was number one, it's a pension for the future. Um, I lost my mum when I was really young and, I, I, and she had nothing, and I thought, well, I need some security. So, number one, it was security. Then, as I learned about property, I moved on to generate property as um, income, but then also to give it to the bank as security to get loans to grow my trading business. So, really, I guess for you, it's a safe place to keep money and it appreciates. And so then you can leverage that and release equity from it to, to grow your businesses. Yeah, it's not actually releasing. I don't release equity. Okay. I just let the bank- Offer it as security. Offer it as security, right. which works for trading brick and mortar businesses. Like yeah. I've got a chain of day nurseries, um, 10 indoor play centers, two farm attractions and uh, an ice cream company. And those businesses are always spending capital. Um, and if I can then borrow that capital over 20 years by giving property a security, to me, out of all the things that I've discovered, nothing creates more tax efficient wealth than being an entrepreneur with a trading business. Yeah. I actually find property now quite taxing. So if you make money Definitely. on property, you are taxed quite extremely and let me give you an example of that as well say I built a business from scratch with fifty thousand pounds worth of cash and I then turned it into a business that makes a million pounds profit a year over ten years say worked really hard to have done that I then sell that business for three million quid on the first million pounds I'd only pay ten percent tax and then on the rest, I would pay 20%. So what would that be? Half a million pounds tax on three million pounds worth of sale. Now, if that was property, if I sold a property with a three million pound gain, I'm gonna be paying a lot more than half a million pounds in tax, especially if it's residential. Now, if it's commercial, which I much prefer, there are capital allowances and some other things that you can do. So your interest in property is it primarily commercial would you say that's really no i've got quite a lot of residential but i don't think residential is 
all it's cracked up to be from when I first started out. Would you say primarily it's it's more hands-on residential? No, 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 the tax changes. Okay. Higher stamp duty to acquire yes. the property, much lower stamp duty on commercial. Um, you can claim all your interest back if you own it in your own name on commercial. You cannot do that on uh, residential anymore, um, even though I do own all my commercials in a limited company. Um, capital allowances, that I don't know if you know the process of what yeah. that is. So if you, the fit out costs, you get capital allowances. It can be hundreds of thousands of pounds worth of um, uh, tax refunds and deferment of tax and uh, when you sell it or when you uh, fit in the property out. So they're, they're, that's a huge advantage there. Um, you can usually get 100% finance if you're putting your own profit trading business in there. Really, yeah, so why not just sell all your residential and just buy commercial, commercially sold? Well, I don't want to sell my residential because it's going to be so taxing and I'd rather have the income. That said, though, Sage, I am buying a block of flats right now. Okay. And I'll tell you why I'm buying the block of flats. Um, it's a limited company, so yeah. half percent stamp duty. Okay. So, so it's a business, essentially, you're buying that has the assets. The assets yeah, just, just one block of flats. Yeah, and they own it in a limited company. And I have a rule that I want at least 10% rent per annum on my total capital deployed. So that's whether I'm putting the money in or putting my money in with the bank. So if I'm buying something for a million quid, I want at least 100,000 rent back per year. So you've got gross return as 10%. Yeah, okay. which is difficult to do on residential unless you're doing HMOs and service accommodation. Yeah. I have no interest in that. Because they, they are much more hands-on. Yeah, they, they're you are running vampires. businesses then. Yeah. Because you're taking the property and turning it into a business Correct. rather than just doing yeah. a, a But 10% that. is much easier to do in commercial. Yeah. You buy a million pound warehouse and rent it out for a hundred thousand, much easier than buying, you know, four houses at quarter of a million quid each and trying to help. You don't have to buy a quarter of a million pound house. You could buy a, a cheap uh, house up in the northeast. Yeah, and what and I don't like about return. so I have got some property up in Manchester, and yeah, I've got those good returns, but the capital growth isn't as yes. good as down in the southeast. Yeah. So in the southeast, I've managed to find by using commercial property, I can help myself to both capital appreciation which is just fantastic and also decent yields on my rental uh, but I can't find many deals of doing that on residential yeah and I guess with residential one of the reasons people get involved in property is a long-term capital growth but if you mm. find the right places you'll get better growth but you're paying more to get in yeah. to the property in the first place there see I've never really got into commercial property had commercial tenants mm. we've taken commercial property converted it to residential use yeah and, yeah, oh, and I know lots of people have done that. It's very, it's a very good. System. That's good. It works. Yeah. And I've looked at commercial. I've spoke to people doing commercial, and I've always seen commercially. It's just a simple. It's a place to put your money. It's not. It's not a business, uh, as such. The only it's, it's, time you can do an uplift is if you if you've got you've getting a higher rent, and uh, you've got a higher yield, i.e. the value is higher. That's it. So there's a couple of ways of getting an uplift on commercial property. So the. the most recent one we bought was an industrial estate, 1.4 million pounds. Um, we're getting about 140,000 rent off of that. We've got 14 individual tenants. We've got land at the back that hasn't been developed. We've got outline planning permission. We're just now going full planning permission to build 22 more units on. Okay. So whenever I'm looking to buy a business, a property, a residential property, a commercial property, whatever it is, I'm looking for decent cash flow. How can I? use entrepreneurial skill set if you like to increase the value uh, and find something better i don't want to do what accidental landlords do which i did when i was 18 and just yes. buy a house and hope for capital growth and make 150 pound a month after the mortgage well you'll have done well out of the houses that you've bought no yeah doubt. and then that's right i have done well out of them and they've served me well because i had a trading business and i'd be able to offer them a security to go and buy other trading businesses that make much more yields than property would so um you started this business when you were, what, 19? No, I was much younger than that. Okay. I was about 16. I was going out doing magic shows and right. doing balloon modelling and kids' parties. So you've been at this for how long then? I'm 36 now. Okay. So 20 years. A few years, okay. So uh, I'm guessing you're in a position right now where you could just call it a day and just put your feet up. Definitely, I sold up, yeah. So what's stopping you from doing that? I don't know. It's like a cancer. Yeah. Um, Would you say business and entrepreneurship it's once you've got it in your veins you, you just yeah i'm definitely going to yeah i will stop when i die yes and i've just you know accepted that's that many people i speak to i think that are very driven in business sometimes people say to me as well you know when are you going to stop 
I said, well, yeah. when they're carrying you out in a box. You don't yeah, want it, to stop it. It it's becomes like, part uh, of your life. You know, like alcoholics and gambling addictions. It's like I wasn't they're quite not going to use those as a... <laughs> no, but they're not allowed. You know, people <laughs> don't accept that. But if you've got entrepreneurialism running through your yeah. veins, it is like an addiction. And, and lots of the people that I come across, yet yeah, the money that the people make, they only really want to make more money to do more stuff with yeah. it, employ more people, buy yeah. more business, buy more... Pro and, yeah, they have a, an okay lifestyle, but the amount of hours they put in... Yes. Um, and it, but one of the other things, I've got two children now, and I, I do find that also... I love being around them, so, uh, I, you know... Would you say they're part of what drives you to keep going? No. Because that evolves as goes over time. No, we no, they, they don't drive me because my drive has been exactly the same pre them okay. and after them. They're four and one now. Yeah. I'm still just as driven. Everyone keeps saying to me, as you get older, you will slow down. I'm just doing the bigger, yeah. bigger stuff. And I, I, I know really successful. I'm thinking of a particular gentleman now. He's 70 years old and he's carrying on just as aggressive as a 25, 30-year-old, yeah. 40-year-old entrepreneur. It's, it's in his blood. I guess I won't be thinking about slowing down, but you evolve in terms of what you get involved with, your appetite for risk changes, as other people you're thinking about. So some, but, but what I get involved with now is I want to be as high a barrier to entry as possible. Yeah. So I would never want to buy one buy to let, one HMO, um, one house. I want to buy blocks of flats. Yes. I want to buy industrial estates. I want to buy bigger businesses. I think it's a really smart move to concentrate on one thing and do it really, really well. When I started in property, I was trying to do everything. It's a typical yeah. entrepreneurship trait of uh, the shiny it's, penny syndrome. Yeah, yeah, everything looks interesting. Five minutes you're doing this, six months yeah. later you're doing that. That is the cancer of but the But when you're building businesses like the way you are, you've got lots of different businesses. And I, I, you know, I watch your content, I see there's a connection, the looser connection, but they're all different businesses. They're all shooting off in different directions. Well, it's really important that all of my businesses, one of our key rules is they must fold into existing empire. So even with our property business, you know, there must be a correlation between the two. And, I, and lots of people do criticise me on what you just said there. But like our ice cream company, Rossi, supplies all of our leisure businesses with ice cream. Our teddy bear business, we have a very big teddy bear business, made over a million teddy bears. My business is the biggest customer of our toy wholesale business. You were just, when we started, you walked through our gift shop, yeah. there's tons of the products in there that we've made. Um, what, you know, some of our biggest commercial properties, my leisure businesses are the tenants of it from my property company. It's really important. So the philosophy that I believe in is the four companies. Company number one is your survival company. Um, that's who you are today. That's got to pay the bills, cash flow. Number two is a thriving company. This is the company you really want to be when you're finished and this is your, you know, your, the, the end in mind business. Company number three is a media and marketing company. That's why I spend so much time doing this stuff. And that forwards in warm leads into those yes. operating companies. And then company four is a property investment company. Company. And the profits from your operating companies go into there. So if your company's in trouble, you can re-leverage that business, um, uh, re-leverage those properties and reinvest back into companies one and two. You look at a company like Thomas Cook, which was a 200-year-old British you know, mammoth company. Really, yeah. But they used to own everything, hotels, planes, real estate. They sold all that all off. The verticals, yeah. Yeah, they sold all that off to excessively grow that business. Then when they're in trouble, they went to the bank and said, can you lend us some money? And they go, what security you got? They had nothing left. Yeah, bottled to the hilt. And so that's why I think if you've got assets around you, although you might... I, I'm always thinking about cost of capital deployed. So whatever I put my money in, is could I be putting it in somewhere else to make better returns? Um, and... What they did there was they, they thought about their cost of capital. Blood. Hmm, we've got a £20 million hotel here. We could sell and lease that back, get the £20 million back and lease 20 other hotels. Now, in theory, that means that you're going to grow the business, make more money, more turnover. When you catch a cold, you're in trouble, aren't you? Because mm. you're over-leveraged. People watching this right now, there'll be at different stages of their life, their career, their business. Some people might be thinking about getting started in property and business. Other people might be very young, just thinking about, is this even for them? And one of the things that I've seen, I've been in business just over 30 years, uh, and lots of ups and downs along the way. But doing business now is very different when starting businesses, say, 20, 30 years ago. And a key thing you mentioned was Company 3 Media. Would you say that's a key part of what you do right now in terms of where business what, comes from? What's fantastic about it, Saj, is people like you and I can now compete in that 
if we're prepared to put the work yeah. in. Whereas this has been going on forever. But you needed Different to be medium. Disney, BBC, ITV, be on TV, own a newspaper, yes. own a radio station to be able to tickle those taste buds yes. within that. But now we can be on Instagram, LinkedIn and wonderful YouTube and build our own niche audiences and what's even better, become famous to a few, which is what I'm doing. You can eventually have half a million subscribers that are niche down into your section yeah. of property that's actually more powerful actually than being on BBC One probably. Absolutely, I completely get that. Do you think people starting out in business understand that though today? And those that have already been in business a while, do you think they understand that? They, they probably realise Yellow Pages is dead, but do yeah. they understand the big movement that's happening in terms of where your future business is going to be? But they have to want to, so I've lots of people ask me about this, they have to want to do a podcast. They have to like being on the microphone. They have to be happy being on camera. And I don't, if you're not that, then actually you need to pay someone else to be the personality of your business, which also companies have been doing for you. Pepsi, Coca-Cola pay celebrities to be the face of their business. Um, it's just smart people that can use their personal brand. Richard Branson done this, didn't he, for Virgin. You know, Alan Sugar done it years ago, you know, but they had to use mainstream media. Um, do people understand? I think they do, but they don't realise it's such hard work. I mean, you you really have to put in the hours to build a personal brand, don't you? There's no doubt about that. I mean, but it, it's accessible to everybody, and I yes. think that's the thing. There's there's nothing yeah. special about what we're doing, other yeah. than just putting the effort in. Yeah, which most people won't do. And I think many will give up before they start seeing the rewards. Yeah, we we, we track all this stuff. You know, most people don't get past five episodes on a mm -hmm. podcast. Because they yeah. make episode five, they, well, well, no, a million people aren't listening to this. It's funny you should say that. The last time I launched a show on YouTube f a few years ago, I got to episode five and then shelved it. Yeah. Because the amount of time and effort it was taking. It's, yeah, it's a lot of work. Um, and, and YouTube, you know, is hard, isn't it, to build? But once you've got them, yeah. it's, it's, do you know, I see YouTube very similar to property. You know, you buy property in year one. You don't really make any yes. money if you just buy a normal buy today. But after 10 years, you know, you've benefited from much higher rents, lots of capital growth. Yes. And I think YouTube, if you think, if you invested 10 years into YouTube, wow, will we, well, that will trump anything you can do on property. Yeah, I, I, I think I agree with you completely. I, but I think many people don't get that. They just no. don't understand how quickly it's moving and how it's evolving and yeah. where where the, what the future of marketing is yeah, yeah. and lead generation for, for business, regardless of what business you're in. And you mentioned a couple of key names, there, Richard Branson and Alan Sugar. I remember when I was at school, they were the only business yeah. influencers, Celebrity. leaders that yeah, we yeah. knew. Yeah, so yeah. when I was yeah. interested in business, it was definitely wasn't the sexy entrepreneurship that it is today, this hustle, hustle, yeah. hustle. Even 10 years about. ago, there was the Dragon's Den lot. Yes. Alan Sugar, Richard Branson, Steve Jobs, Bill Gates, Donald Trump. Yeah. That, you know, that, there was, you can literally count it on your fingers and toes how many business celebrities there are now but yeah I absolutely and I thoroughly believe and that's why I carry on investing and it's been tough for me I mean I've got you know I've got nearly a thousand members of staff Saj, wow. across my group um, and I've got a really good marketing team I feel like I know marketing I've wrote three books on business one of them on marketing I've had a full-time videographer work for me for nearly four years and wow. we're just starting to break through and most people are not prepared to put that effort in but as you said those rewards are just uh, phenomenal. I, I see businesses, some uh, people that I talk to and, and peers in business and what they're doing, you think that's working now, give it another few years and you are going to really struggle to generate leads the way you are now. Yeah, you yeah. really need to switch on to the, the digital world of where things are going. Hey, if you enjoyed this content, then make sure you smash that like button and also subscribe to the channel. This way you'll get notified when I'm doing more interviews just like this and digging deep and really getting behind on what makes these entrepreneurs tick. What, what I love about um, if people build like um, a personal brand using YouTube is people can deselect and select whether they want to work with yeah. you before they meet you, which just saves you a lot of time in life. Yes. And uh, so if people are watching this now, they go, mm, I don't really like Saj, or I really like Saj, then when they meet you, they're like ready to do yes, business with you, absolutely. which is just fantastic. And it's also leverage work. So yeah, yes. you've you know tr slapped down from Birmingham, haven't you, today to make this with me. It's like the other side of the world. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but what's really good, both of us are making this, and this is what I love about YouTube, this video will continue to work for you in 10 years' time. Yes. And I love, that's why I put so much effort into it. I just think, I'm making a podcast. In 10 years' time, maybe 250,000 people might have listened to it for that one half-hour piece of work, and I love stuff like that. 
So what do you think is the future now in terms of what you're doing with your business? Where, where do you want to take it? Where, where are you wanting to get to with your your property, your businesses, your yeah. ventures, growth? So I want... Uh, you know, for, before you answer that, you know, a thousand uh, staff is a, a lot of uh, stress and headache to deal with uh, as well on a day-to-day basis. There are lots of ventures. You're trying to grow things. You're trying to add more businesses in. Yeah. Let's talk about the staff thing first of all. Then I'll tell you where do I want to take the business and what do I want to do with the property. Having 60, 70 staff, no, actually, let me answer that. Two or three staff made my life a lot easier. Going past 12 staff to 100 was quite stressful. Up to 12, beautiful. Great culture, fantastic. Um, between 12 and 100, I, I think I struggled with that a bit more. Um, now, it's actually much easier. Having a bigger business okay. is much easier than having a medium-sized business. A small boutique business is beautiful. A medium-sized business is really hard. You start needing the resources of a big business, but you haven't got the cash flow, and you're burning cash at a rate that just is just disastrous. And actually, the economy, the world economies, don't really support medium-sized businesses. Someone that has three restaurants really struggles to the person that has 150 restaurants. But the person that has one restaurant usually is having a fantastic life. They can afford a manager. They're pulling cash out of the business. It's just if they've got that entrepreneurial flair, go, actually, I'll open a second restaurant and just double my income. That, that very, very rarely happens. Actually, the person burns out and then usually returns to life safe again and goes back to the one. Um, and so my point is there, while sanding a thousand staff seems very, very scary, um, it's actually made my life much easier because I can now afford great people to help me grow my businesses. And I think having the right people is absolutely key in terms of building yeah. a business without, without a doubt. My whole philosophy for entrepreneurs is, uh, this is what I call the formula for success for businesses, E plus M equals S, entrepreneurship plus management equals success. What lots of entrepreneurs do is try and be the manager and the entrepreneur. Yeah. And you entrepreneurs will burn make out. bad managers. They make bad managers. And so my role within our organisation is to grow our business and my MD operates our business. And I spend 80% of my time growing it and 20% of my time operating it. Most business owners yes. are spending 80% of their time yeah. operating and then when they've got time, they try and grow it. That's something I've really seen in what you do. You know, you can see the effort you put into building the brand, the visibility, as we were talking about, like 80% of your time is literally as a sales yeah. marketer of the business. Yeah, someone commented on my last YouTube channel, oh, how do you get, where, how are you so organised? Like, yeah. How do you fit so much in your day? I'm the most unorganised yes. person you'll ever meet, Saj. I am disastrous. Well, got a PA I really just float around all day and just stick my oar in into multiple things but it just seems that's to work. ideal for an entrepreneur that's what you want to do people yeah, are getting is, on yeah. what they do they're good at I'm, what they I'm do just well, this morning I was going to be on a, a call with a solicitor about some brand infringement at half past nine. I didn't check my diary till yeah. quarter to ten Tracy rang me and said where are you you're going to be oh, forgot about that. sorry <laughs> and I'm just I'm, I'm pretty disastrous you know like I forget things all the time I lose my wallet I lose my keys you know I, I just I'm not I'm just terrible at managing things so when people meet you for the first time do you, are you the person that they were expecting do you think um, I don't know I want to be a nice person yeah we um, all want to be liked and loved yeah, no, I, I know lots of super sick that actually don't care about that. Yeah. People that are very wealthy. I, I, I like being a nice person, which actually is quite difficult when you're um, trying to be a good business person. I have to stand up for myself at times, and yeah. I know there are people that don't like me, but I try and be fair and reasonable with everything that I do in life. Otherwise, you get walked over all yeah. the time. Yeah, yeah. So you mentioned no like and trust. This is some a philosophy that we definitely have nailed to the wall in terms of what we do in our business. It, uh, having content out there so people get to know you, like you, trust you. So when it comes to doing business, it's just, uh, as you said, that filtration process has already happened. It's like this huge funnel, people of awareness of who you are, and what you do. And then when it comes to doing business, they're approaching you, it's, you're ready to do business. Uh, and when you're approaching new brands, you're looking to buy things, uh, other businesses, you find this helps in terms of you're already th- you're visible. Yeah, you I'll, might not know them, yeah. but they know a hell of a lot so, about you. I get opportunities sent to me every week, every sometimes daily, 
um, and I'm le learned to say no. Yeah. And then when I want to say yes, I then go into it. Um, property opportunities come to me that are off market because people know that I'm, and I'm out there telling people, yeah, we're always looking, we're always doing things. And back to your original question, like, where do I want to get my property and where portfolio and where do I want to get my business? So with my property for it, I want to get a three million pound rent roll. That's my aim because that will always, you know, there'll be mortgages to come off of that, but that'll always supply plenty of fat and cash flow should any of my businesses have a wobble and there will always be wobble times yeah. coronavirus has yeah. proved that more than anything um in fact i would actually say if i didn't have property i think um coronavirus would have taken me out of my trading businesses uh, or seriously not taking me out but it would have been a lot more stressful yes. so property is de-stressed business it's if you like solid base and then with my business, I wanted to build a fifteen million pound turnover business with a sort of a two million, two and a half million of EBITDA, which is earnings before interest, tax, and depreciation. We've sort of got that now, and I thought I wouldn't be good enough back then when I set that aim to take the business to the next level. I thought it'd become way more. You need a proper businessman rather than an entrepreneur to run it. But I'm more pleased now that I can say that I'll probably take it to fifty million, and then. I think it will need someone much better than me to run it, and then I'll. So just before assist. I get to my final question, those numbers you picked aren't they just vanity numbers? You just pick them out of thin air. Well, no, because the first, so our rent roll right now for all of our properties is about five hundred and fifty thousand. So, yeah, what well, what are we there? Yeah. We're we're not a third, we're but yeah, we're sixth of the way there. Um, and obviously it will get easier because as every year goes on, you're building up more equity, yeah. you're building up more um, knowledge um, and you find better deals, you're able to do bigger deals. And so I should be able to bulk that up over the next five years. I think I'll get to that, maybe 10 years. Like five, yeah. By the time I'm 45, I hope I've got to that 3 million rent roll. Then the, the, I believe you need to have an aim to get to. Yeah. And I'm not looking at what the capital growth is. I want the rent roll because that's, what pays the bills, pays the mortgages, pays the maintenance, pays the tax. Um, and I want to be able to enjoy some income along the way and not get to 70 and go, hey, <laughs> look how wealthy I am now and I've got five years left. You know, that's, um, So it's really important that I, I, I think about income and not be a traditional Brit. Uh, uh, you know, Save every, it for your old age. Yeah, right? and your children just sell it and then have a great life yeah. for 30 years and you put all the work in. And then the business. No, I, I, I want everyone to know, yeah, look, we're building a £15 million pound business that makes £2 million quid. Um, now, uh, I'll say that we'll be a £50 million pound business, but we'll probably only make £5 million quid on that £50 million quid because as you grow, you have more middle management, more costs. But I just I know that's what I'm like. I'm just going to keep on doing it because I like doing it. This is super interesting and I have more and more questions that keep coming to mind. And, as and I the other thing as well, so it's like people approach me now all the time to buy me. Yeah, to sell. And I, I've got, you know, I've spoken to friends of mine. I've been approached and when I say approached, I mean offers. Yes. Like, and for serious life-changing amounts of money. Stops and makes you think. Yeah, but I don't end up, no, I don't want to sell it because I, I only have a lump money and I want to go again. And I, yeah. I like my team that I work yeah. with. I like the team that I've built around I genuinely love coming to work with my team that I work with and I spend more time with them than anyone else and I always always say to me wherever you work whether you work for someone or you build a business if you don't like the people you're around you want to really waste it yes there'll, of there'll your be life. a number though I mean everyone has a number uh, that I'm not going to ask you what that number is oh, I don't mind you, but someone's offered, offered me that. 12 million for my day nurseries someone's offered me um, a bit more than that for the whole business and they were they were seriously yeah. tempting numbers. So if you had a substantial number, what what would you then do? Would you start would you want to start again and yeah. be in leisure? Yeah. That's a true what, entrepreneur. You you, yeah. you take what you've learned and you think, okay, let's go again. Yeah, it's but not I want to be in my sector. I you know I like buying carousels, teacup rides, and you know train. I'm building a dinosaur park, camping site down at our other thing. You know I love day nurseries. I love family entertainment centres. You know I just want to be in that space. And actually, as you build your business every year get better systems better processes better ways of running the business and you become more and more profitable um so if you're spinning off you know but when you sell something that's that's when you really become wealthy and you can do things even yeah. better because everyone believes in you 
I think I, I think that's once you've exited once on a big exit, yeah. second time round, not that I've done it, but you see that it'll become much, much easier to do, yeah, to yeah. do it again. I think emotionally, you know, I am emotionally tied to my business. Mm. I care about it. I care about the people. So I, I, I think I feel lost if I sold yeah, it. It's your baby. It's, you've grown yeah, and nurtured yeah, it. Yeah. And these are personality businesses, not like a... You know, you know, this here, there's like 2,000 people here today having a family fam day out. And I just, you know, everyone associates my name with Marsh Farm, Party Man or Rossi. And I, I care about that. So, James, that leaves it to my, my final question around what you've created now. If you had to start again and create it again, what would you do differently? I would think higher barrier to entry from the beginning. So I made some errors in the early days that taught me. So I opened a stretch limousine company. I had a couple of party shops. I had a bouncy castle company. Those businesses are swapping time for money businesses that are hard to leverage, hard to get repeat customers, um, hard to get good margin. And then as my careers developed, I realized that you want to choose businesses that have good margin, good average customer value and repeat customers. And sometimes businesses where you get a little bit of money a lot of the time from a lot of people like Tesco's, like Sainsbury's, you know, every time everyone's going in £100 a time, they're going three times a week or five times a month. And it, it's much easier to build um, uh, less fickle customers. So the day nursery business, for example, it's... They're less fickle. When I was a kid's entertainer, though, I was very booked up. People only needed me once a year and probably for four years before their kids grew up. Yeah. Whereas Sainsbury's get a customer and you might have them multi-generational because that's that family supermarket. Same for Tesco's, only for to Waitrose, Marks and Spencer's. And so um, I chose decisions in the early days that were lower barrier to entry, that were easier to break into market share. But because they're easier to break in, everyone competes with you. And that's the thing with rent to rent in property yeah. or service to accommodation or HMOs. It's quite easy for anyone to do it. Race down to the bottom in terms of price. Exactly. Yeah. Where, whereas if you say, oh, no, I'm not going to do service mm. I'm actually going to build a 500 bedroom hotel. Most people just can't yes. attain that in their head how that's possible. But if you actually think like that, you realise you're competing with a lot less people. And then when you achieve it, and other humans have, so it is possible. Absolutely. Um, and, and I think about with our leisure business, you know, I started out with indoor play centres and someone else would open in the town. They might not be as good as us, but they might help themselves to 30, 40% of our turnover yeah. for a few months. That would hurt. Um, whereas now, I think zoos and outdoor attractions, even if you've got the money, you've got to find a site, have the planning permission. There's these barriers to entry yes. that stop you competing with me. And that's one of my biggest learns. Excellent. James, it's been a pleasure confronting you. Thank you. And what's the best way for people to learn more about you? I would love you to check out my YouTube channel. I've made, I think, three times more videos than you, and you've you had more indeed. results than me. <laughs> well, it depends how you define <laughs> results. No, no, yeah, no. You're doing so, an amazing job. I, I've got a business and entrepreneurship channel. I'm passionate about helping business owners and entrepreneurs grow their business, and I do marketing and how to buy businesses. And you know, one of the other things, Saj, that I love doing is buying failing businesses, building them up and then getting ready for sale and having that mentality of yes. I'm building to sell, although I've only ever sold one business. Um, and I love showing people how you can literally buy great businesses with hardly any money, even with bank support, whereas I think a lot of people try and do that in property. Yes. And actually, it's much harder to do in property. Yes, it's definitely much harder. I think there's a lot more rules and regulations. Yeah. People don't quite understand them. They just get the bigger picture. Well, the thing is, Sajid, you think about it, you go to your bank and say, hey, I'm doing this no money down property deal where I'm getting a gifted deposit or I'm you know, trying to put no money in to acquire the property. The bank hates it. They will just hate, hate it, hate it, hate it. And probably you're committing mortgage fraud somewhere yes. along the line. You go to the bank, the same bank say, I can get this business for free and I'm going to turn it around. Can you lend me some money to help me do it? They're like, they love yeah. that. Because <laughs> it's, and, and I've done that multiple times with bank support. That's fantastic. Yeah. James, thank you so much for your time. Thank you, Sarge.